All right. No interesting music for me to walk into this time. Instead, it's Econ After Hours because it's dark outside. And I didn't have enough time to try and find some interesting music. So I'm just going to make this video and we're going to talk about inflation. New chapter, new topic. Talked a little bit about inflation last chapter where we talked about the economic indicators for an economy. And the three main economic indicators were GDP, inflation, and employment or unemployment. And so those three things really are our best indication of how well is your economy doing. We didn't touch so much on inflation because it kind of deserves its own chapter. It's a little complicated, but also interesting, at least in my opinion. So this chapter, we're going to talk about inflation and its indicators. But before we do that, I would like to congratulate, in case you did not see my Schoology update during spring break, some people who've won the stock market game. So first off, congratulations to Isabel and Kaylee, who are our top team in the class. And then Christopher and Brittany were our second best team in the class. So congratulations to you guys. Both of these teams met the necessary investment requirements and beat me in the standings. And each team is going to receive a 1% extra credit boost on their final overall semester grade in the class. So well done there. Now, as a reminder, these slides are posted. You can follow along with me on these slides, especially when we get to the, oh boy, calculations in just a bit. So we're gonna start by talking about what is inflation. Inflation just means that there's a general level, a general rise in your level of prices. And that doesn't just mean for one thing, it means for all things, because that's macroeconomics and that's fourth quarter. We're talking about the entire economy, not just one good here. Put another way, inflation is a decline in the value of your money, because your money doesn't go as far as it used to. So, for example, Let's say last year you may have been able to buy bananas for 41 cents a pound, okay? And then this year, because of inflation, banana prices have now increased to 55 cents a pound. And it's not just bananas, but the price of all the goods and services that you buy are going up. When you go and fill up your car with gas, when you go and buy headphones, when you go and buy, uh, get coffee at Starbucks or go to a movie. Ha! Remember when you used to be able to go to movies? Or your Spotify subscription, etc. So the price of all the things in the economy is going up. That's inflation. What inflation does is it causes a decrease in the purchasing power of your money. The purchasing power of your money is an interesting economics definition, which basically means the amount of goods and services that can be acquired per unit of currency. So you have a higher purchasing power when your money is worth more, because suddenly you're able to go out and buy so many different things. You have the power, the purchasing power, to buy so many different goods. But when your money is worth less, well, you lost some of that power. This is important. Inflation can't be avoided. It occurs in every economy at various times. It's not a matter of stopping inflation. In fact, you actually kind of don't want to stop inflation. You actually would rather have inflation than not have it at all. And one of the main reasons why is if you don't have it at all, you're risking going into deflation, which we're going to talk about later in this chapter. So typically, actually, what you want is about 2 to 3% of inflation. Now, once you start getting to super high levels of like 5, 7, or even above 10%, then you start getting worrisome. So you take a look at this chart, which I posted in those slides, uh, you'll see the United States inflation has hovered around uh, 2 to 4% since 2000 to about 2016. But in the year 2015, we were super low, that's worrisome. But most worrisome was 2008 during the Great Recession when we actually had deflation occur and <laughs> we might have that from the coronavirus. So how do we measure inflation? 
One primary way of measuring inflation is through CPI, Consumer Price Index, which is what I'm going to have you calculate in the worksheet for the assignment that goes along with this video. So Consumer Price Index, what is that? CPI is measured by calculating the change in, the change in the price of different goods. Actually, what it measures is about 200 urban goods, and it looks at those prices from, well, month to month, but mostly from year to year. Included in those 200 different goods is a lot of stuff. And you can take a look at this list in the slides, but it could be food and beverages, like, you know, cereal, milk, coffee. It could be things in your house, like the rent that you pay, or, you know, your furniture that you go out and buy, apparel, so the clothes you buy, transportation, like vehicles and gas, and um, you know, airplane tickets, medical care, like the prescription drugs you get, uh, physician services, you can go get your eyes checked, uh, recreation, like a new TV or a new toy, a new pet product, a new sports equipment, whatever, education communi and communication, so a new phone, um, college tuition, uh, and then it also includes like other things like smoking products, like cigarettes and haircuts. So it includes a lot of stuff. Basically, it looks at our entire economy, a lot of the commonly purchased goods, 200 of them. And if we take a look at where it all breaks down, actually 42% of our consumer price index components fall into the housing sector. So furniture, your rent, um, you know, new appliances, things like that. And, you know, a house costs a lot of money. And then the, we have about 16% uh, that's made up in transportation, 14% in food and beverage, but it, it's spread throughout the economy pretty good. Our current 2020 CPI reflects the, uh, the, pre, the present cost of a basket of those 200 goods, and we compare that to the basket that cost $100 in 1984. So as of September 2019, our CPI was 256, which we compare, compare back to uh, that it used to be $100. Now it's $256 for that same you know, basket of goods. So the rate of inflation, easy calculation because you've already done this with GDP. When we measure GDP growth, it's the same equation of when we measure inflation growth. And what you take is CPI year two minus CPI year one and divide it by CPI year one. Just like GDP year two minus GDP year one divided by GDP year one. It's a similar equation. I just took out GDP and I switched it with CPI. So if we take uh, September 2018 and September 2019, I had 256 CPI and 252 CPI in 2018. So I take 256 minus 252 and divide it by 252. If you times it by 100, you're going to get your inflation rate as a percent because it's going to give you a decimal times by 100 to get a percent. So 256 minus 252 gives me 4. 4 divided by 252 gives me 0 0.0159 times it by 100 to get an inflation rate of 1.59%. That's pretty good. Might want it a tiny bit higher, but it's not bad. Another way of measuring inflation, if we want to do something different than calculating CPI, is measuring PPI, or producer price index. So consumer price index is us buying things and what it costs us. Producer price index is calculated based on the selling price that producers receive for a basket of goods. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, isn't it the same thing as CPI? Because consumers go out and buy things, it's the same price as what producers sell it for, right? You're right in thinking that, but there's a slight catch to it. Producer price index is different from consumer price index because producers not only sell those final goods that we would go out to the store and buy, but they also sell intermediary goods and raw materials to other producers. For example, you could have a cotton company that sells their cotton to a, a clothing manufacturer. Now, we don't go buy cotton 
we go by the close. So we don't count that cotton in the CPI, but we do in the PPI. Same thing for things like, you know, corn or, you know, corn is using so many different products. It's not so much us going and actually buying corn, but how much do, you know, food manufacturers who use corn pay for that corn? And then, for example, like how much do auto manufacturers or uh, transportation pay for steel to put into their automobiles? So in these instances, it's not the exact th same thing as CPI. But the good news for you is we calculate it the exact same way. We take PPI year one minus, or PPI year two minus PPI year one divided by PPI year one. So if I have September 2019, September 2018, it was actually just a difference of one between 205 and 204. So 205 minus 204 gives me one. One divided by 204 gives me 0 0.0049. Times that by 100, I get a 0.49 inflation rate, so it's slightly different and lower than when I calculated CPI. Last little bit here. Why is this important? Why do we care about inflation? It's important because as a reminder to last chapter, the best indicator in our economy and how well we're doing with production is real GDP. And real GDP, we can only calculate if we know inflation. Because nominal GDP, not the best indicator because it doesn't count for inflation. It could show that we're actually, we're, it could show we're increasing in our economy, but really we're not because all we did was raise the prices. So real GDP is the best. So we need to know inflation in order to calculate real GDP. That's why it's important. So we've got to know how to calculate inflation in order to calculate real GDP. One last interesting little tidbit for you today in this video is a very interesting case of inflation, especially for you seniors who are about to go to college in just a few months. An interesting case of inflation, you can take a look at this slide and this chart more carefully in the slides, is right here. It's a recent GPA trend nationwide in colleges and universities. The average grade awarded at Harvard University, who many usually say is the best university in the country, during the 1950s, the average grade was a C minus that they gave in their classes. The most frequently given grade today at Harvard is an A. And the average course grade is an A minus. So think of this. Times have changed. The number of A's that's going out to students amongst all schools and universities and colleges is going up. And what happens when more and more kids are coming out of college with a high GPA? Well, think of GPAs as currency. And if there's inflation happening, well, you have to spend more money at stores. Well, if there's inflation happening with grades, when you go out into the real world, you're going to need a higher and higher and higher GPA as time goes on in order to get that high quality job. Because suddenly having a 3.5 GPA, which would have been great during the 1950s when the average grade was a C minus, Therefore, the average GPA would have been around a 2. Now, suddenly, a 3.5 actually isn't that great anymore, right? So it's a crazy time period and just something interesting to consider. It's like, whoa, inflation doesn't always mean money, right? It could also mean grades. And with that, I say goodbye from Econ at Night. And guess what I'm going to do next? I'm going to play video games because I may be 27 but I still like to act like I'm 12. See ya.